Welcome to the Free Marketeers, the official podcast of the Free Market Foundation. Hello, dear listeners. This is the latest episode of the Free Marketeers podcast. I am joined by Martin van Staden, as always, but instead of Christo Hatting, we have a special uh, guest today. Uh, his name is Nzuzo Kati. And so maybe just jumping straight into it, uh, who, I, I'm sure our listeners uh, would like to know who is Nzuzo. <laughs> <laughs> so can you, can you introduce yourself, man? Uh, like, uh, where, where are you from? What do you do? Uh, what inspires you? How did you become a libertarian? Uh, you don't Somewhere just decide that he's a libertarian yeah, for him. Decide, My goodness. You just decide that I'm Jeez. a libertarian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. be how did you have complete opposite? How, how, okay, <laughs> what, what is your... Uh, what do you believe in? Yeah. In, terms uh, of your, in terms of your philosophy, but answer the introduce yourself first. Okay. Um, hi, listeners. Um, like you said, my name is Nzuzo Kati. Um, so, yeah, I grew up in Joburg uh, my whole life. Um, I went to... I actually went to a school for from grade one to twelve, mm. throughout, and um, mm. Catholic school. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, private school. Yeah, oh. private school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, and then after I went on to go study law at Wits University. Mm. Um, I'm still, um, you know, thinking to myself, was that even worth it? But <laughs> of course it was. <laughs> Lawyers yeah. represent. Come on. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I attained my. Um, LLB in 2017 and then after I went to go study at ECT um, tax law mm-hmm. um, also you know question I'm still asking myself but, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah um, I think um, I started uh, moving towards in terms of like uh, basically free markets and uh, li- uh, libertarian during the fees must fall movement mm-hmm. yeah, like that was my like hmm. ultimate um that's interesting yeah, yeah. that's yeah, that, i didn't ultimate, know that my ultimate um stage where i actually was like do i yeah am so I, you so you oppose the the fees must fall broadly it, it broadly speaking okay. yes yes i was um i supported the students in the fight for you know obviously you know financial exclusion but mm. the means and the people that they were actually fighting against were um i felt like i disagreed with them a lot but obviously yeah. you know during those times you kept quiet and you, mm-hmm. even your own friends would go up against you, mm-hmm. you know, so dangerous times on yeah, the university time, campus yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's those times and you be involved in protests where you just walk into class and you just hear tear gas go mm-hmm. off yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and now you <clears throat> you call me <laughs> <up>. <laughs> but uh, yeah that was the but also like uh, throughout my life like I always say um, life is the best teacher you know mm-hmm. my life experience of the best teacher so Throughout my life, I've always seen that um, I, as human beings, we just like you know, nice, we like things, we like better things in life. We always want to test ourselves, mm-hmm. push it to the limits, mm-hmm. and also you know, acquire a comfortable life. You know, get a mm-hmm. yeah. when you get so, older. So, so oh, it's really interesting to me because you said that uh, uh, the phrase must fall protest sort of push push yourself towards uh, free markets and so how just explain a bit more about that process what's what's exactly turned you off about the movement because it seems like you did agree with some of their aims yeah i did in the beginning yeah uh, I, I agreed with the fact that you know fees were just going up you know without any rationale behind it because mm-hmm. in because firstly in a free market you want lower prices so you can attract more customers mm-hmm. then after that you realize that maybe it's um it's um it's a it's a it's a it's a tension between government and also the higher education systems mm. which are all of them public right all of the um, fees was for well the movement was against public um, universities increasing mm. and and actually saying that the university's decolonization which is just another front for um yeah. you know marxism mm-hmm. and socialism i want you um i don't like western values and stuff like that and they were just trying to shut down freedom of speech those are the methods that they used, you know, to intimidate and threaten students that are mm-hmm. actually against them. Which w- we weren't actually against you guys. We actually understand your, but your means and your your rationales for doing all you mm-hmm. all these protests and and bombing. You know, you know, at Vit, people are trying to actually bomb kids uh, students yeah. are in the yeah. lecture hall. So I was like, what kind of 
human being was to so, kill so for you it was more the it was more the violence they started not only the violence like i said the rationales you mm. know when i listen to these speeches you know that have speeches every day yeah. you know they'll listen to this and they'll be like you know the the <clears throat> the administration the, the vcs are the ones that are proposing this increase so they can exclude black people mm. and you know stuff like that and i was just like no the more people you have no matter if they're black or white the better for for any institution yeah and then i started looking into it more and i was like and on top of that when i went to uct i saw that you know some of these administrators are paid way too much professors are paid over a million rand in at uct yeah. which i don't some professors have never even worked in their life yeah. they're being paid so much so <laughs> such high salaries yeah. and and they'll keep on increasing that's the thing the the um, universities keep on increasing every single year and put up these uh bogus rationales for it like um, yeah. things are getting expensive blah 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 yeah. and i was just like mm, you guys are... I, I think you may be giving the fees must fall people a little bit too much credit there by sympathizing with them i know we have other topics but uh, i guess we can uh, diverge mm-hmm. a bit mm-hmm. um so you say that you're sympathizing with the the uh, uncontrolled increase of prices at universities but don't you think that that is a direct result of the fact that university education in south africa is basically a monopoly of the state um, whereas we do have some private colleges, but for example, they can't call themselves universities. Uh, I know uh, I've I spoke to um, some people who founded a private college re- 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 relatively recently, um, and uh, they couldn't stop saying how difficult it is to actually get accreditation, uh, to get on the good side of the Minister of Higher Education to get your uh, registration and everything sorted out. So I think that the um, the increase in prices is a direct result of the state refusing to to yeah, deregulate well, and and the fees must fall people. I mean, why didn't why wasn't their whole spiel about deregulate higher education, demonopolize, allow private sc- uh, schools, private universities to uh, be established more easily, and there as a as a direct consequence of that, prices will fall. Instead, they asked for more state which means that it will actually be more expensive in the long run. So what do you think about that? Um, I think that um, basically, I I thought that they, okay, how it started, I I agree with that, you know, increases in prices. However, like you said, they they were expecting more of the state to be involved. And those, I feel like, were just political Mm. um, um, affiliations. You know, people, the people that were the leaders were were Mm. mostly politically Mm. affiliated. However, like you said, like the more government comes in, the more. Because also another thing that I also realized is that government was being provider as well as consumer. Because mm. we we're providing mm. um, uh, financial aid to students. However, you guys are still funding uh, universities. So at that point, I never realized how until like you know recently where I realized mm. that mm. actually the state was the person that was causing yes, all true. of this. But as well as the administrators, you know the um, uh, the university administrators, they. They they seem as though it, they made it seem as though we have to keep the administrators, they have to keep the professors and all these people, so that we can provide quality education. But I'm like, yeah, you can do that even if you don't increase decrease prices. Your problem is that you you increasing prices, you increasing your fees because you're getting more money from government and government mm. is not dictating to you. Mm. And you have no comp- like you say you have no competition. There's no private individuals. There's no private institutions mm. that are. Mm actually being given opportunity to um um what do you call it um to compute with you yeah and drive yeah, prices down yeah, yeah. But, but also my my whole issue was the means you don't uh, yeah. you 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 um basically um hindering people from speaking their <laughs> truth, yeah. their opinion so now they were actually infringing on people's freedom of speech so just, freedom of education mm-hmm. the right to yeah, education sorry to interrupt you man like it's a uh, it's uh, just uh, you just touched on an impo- in, in interesting point. You said that you, you you came to the realization that it was government who was causing the problem. So in 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 what way did this uh, realization come to you? Like, did you when um, when um, government said it was free education, said it was free education mm-hmm. for all. but I was like, but that's a free education. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, you guys are not actually. Yeah. Firstly, you're not even implementing your own policy, mm. and secondly, you're just gonna have a more bigger monopoly over. Um, the higher education, the higher education. education. Mm-hmm. so yeah. but so i oh that's that's interesting because uh, you didn't read like any book that's you know well i was obviously reading books but also i mean uh, like a uh, 
Milton I, Friedman or something like that. No, no, so. later on I... Yeah. I realize, but oh, this, my, yeah, this, this, this is very rare. Like it's yeah, very yeah. rare for people to come to that. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, for me it was a problem. It was like people were not allowing us to go to school, mm, mm. and I was like, but what are we doing? We want to get education. We're here for a reason. You know mm. what I mean? Even if some of us, um, even if you feel as though we're being privileged or something, I'm here for a reason. I mm. also I paid. Mm-hmm. You know, or I am gonna pay, or I'm here for. I need to. I need to study because I'm writing exams. Mm-hmm. You know, so like they wouldn't. They wouldn't uh, allow you to write exams. They wouldn't allow you to to go to class. So that was my reason for being truly against this. And uh, like I said, the free education thing. That was my reason for being uh, anti-government. Yeah, because yeah. so, you 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 putting you you adding fuel to the fire. Yeah. And then b- before before you you um before you you were you. you there's no better way to I can think of so I'll just say like before you were converted <laughs> what did you believe before that like it's uh, where were you in the spectrum uh, I think I was I would say more um, to the left a bit mm-hmm. in some aspects and because also I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't uh, driven by principles mm-hmm. of I was just like oh no we should have a free education but when you think about it when you actually rationalize in your head, doesn't actually work. Mm. And based on what the readings like Milton and Thomas and uh, Friedrich, you understand, you rationalize, you actually rationalize why actually free education is the worst thing you can go, mm. you can turn to when you should rather have people actually still paying, because you're actually incentivizing businesses and institutions to pop up. Mm-hmm. And so you have exactly. local, yeah, and you and you force the vits in them, because I don't think yes, vits has, vits has been. Um, an institution for maybe like a hundred years, maybe yeah, about yeah, 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 about. But I don't think you should have a monopoly just because you've been this institution in our mm. in our history. Exactly. Yeah, okay. you shouldn't. You still, it's still an institution that, that thrives on a profit. Yeah, and yeah you need to thing. respond to market forces. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So I, like for sorry, and for me, I always feel like stop. Um, when I and this is where I took, I took uh, last day was where I was like, I'm a car carrying captain. Capitalists, you mm-hmm. all want to good <laughs> yeah, make profit yeah. when we go to work, when yeah. we go to school, when we go to uh, when we start a business, we're all incentivized by profits, mm-hmm. and that's it's it. I don't know, I don't understand why that's a bad thing because mm-hmm. yeah. we want a good thing in life, yeah. right? You want to have a comfortable life, yeah. take care of your family, have your own assets, mm-hmm. you know, be able to t- have a holiday, go overseas. You know what I mean? Like, you yeah. don't know <laughs> people's stuff, you know. It's like once you ask for that and once you say such things, that's when. Um, I was attacked um, as well as even at UCT well, I wasn't necessarily attacked like physically but like you know I would say that to you know groups of people that are in, a, in the law faculty that are towards the left mm-hmm. and I'll say that you know you guys are just as capitalist as everyone you mm-hmm. just don't realize mm-hmm. but you know everyone is just you know they think differently yeah yeah. and, and then that's uh, as, as my final question to you since we have, we have to move on to other topics like uh what can you give us maybe one or two of your favorite pro liberty books or uh, articles or anything there? Uh, basic in- economics by Thomas Sowell. Okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, I'm a I'm a law person, so I would say also um, Rex Rex von Skavik, um mm. Uh, the the book is, escapes my mind right now. Uh, it said one miracle is not enough or panic for democracy. A panic for democracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah panic yeah, for democracy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Those are the ones that I really. Yeah. Um, and plus, you know, different um, contributors to the rule of law and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and yeah. if you can go into what uh, universities teach about law. Uh, Take another hour, but either way, yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. A, that's a, that's a nice way actually to uh, go into the next topic because um I just wanted to get you guys since I have two lawyers with me I wanted to get more of you uh, <laughs> what you guys think the rule of law is what 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 is it to re- relationship to the constitution uh, are the courts upholding the rule of law in South Africa especially the constitutional courts as the ultimate guardian of the constitution and so yeah oh, you guys okay. can just have a, a, a normal yeah conversation. you you, you oh, can start yeah. okay um. Uh, for me, the rule of law was created, as I believe, um, uh, rules for government to mm. govern. Yeah, it was basic protection for private for individuals, normal citizens mm-hmm. against governments who, who are dict- dictatorial, who are tyrannic, um, who are socialist, uh, mm-hmm. who just want to do whatever they want to do yeah. just to make themselves feel good about themselves. You know, so the rule of law is to protect. Um, 
government intervention and limit government to a, mm. to a point where individuals themselves are the ones that are dictating how rules of engagement in normal life mm. is, is, is conducted. So for me, the rule of law, in my opinion, I think that the rule of law is over the constitution. It, it, yes, the constitution is um, a concept of constitutionalism, but the constitution itself must adhere to the rule of law, mm. which is to protect man from an arbitrary government. Mm. And that's why I think that um, our constitution, in in so far as it's um, called the best constitution <laughs> in the world, uh, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really set the guidelines and speak to the uh, to the government itself and say you cannot do this. Mm-hmm. this is, you cannot do this. Mm. You cannot. It's supposed to be telling the government and not the private individuals, because like c- private individuals know how to interact with each other. They're not, mm. you know. And even if one, you know, someone in Eastern Cape who's raping fifty people is not going to affect me, Joba. Mm. However, obviously it's bad, of course. Mm. That's what what he's doing. But it's not going to affect me. But when um, a government says that you know, uh, you must have, um, you must buy sanitary pads or condoms for your for your teenage daughter mm. like you know those are the type of lens that these governments mm. will go so they can you know uh, implement their, their rules and their laws mm. and I'll be, and that affects everybody mm. you know and uh, I'm a con- um, in that respect I'm a conservative when it comes to my kids I don't want my kids near those type of you know no. yeah, yeah but um, back to the constitution I feel like the constitution is firstly too long yeah it 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 it, it gives too much power to government and also, it allows government to do things, which I feel like it it gives government more power in um, uh, promulgating promulgating legislation yeah. in which they have every right to do whatever they want. Mm. Yeah. Which I don't feel like government is supposed to be doing that. Yeah, and yeah. you, and you, Martin. Yeah, I think uh, we agree about uh, what the rule of law means. I, I think um, uh, you. you correctly pointed out that it's uh, a limiting factor uh, it's all about limiting the power and the scope of the state uh, for me more specifically the rule of law is a doctrine that is very specifically aimed at um, uh, guarding against government being arbitrary so it's all about ensuring uh, there's a reason for everything that government does the reason is based on constitutionalist principles and government can justify it and so forth and obviously then it's uh, the nature of the law um, if you want people to abide by the law, they need to know it, they need to be able to read it. And you make a point about the Constitution being too long, I think that's a good point, um, because uh, people can't know a law that's, yeah, that's, that they're never going to be able to read through. Uh, so, so that is an important principle, I think we agree on that. What I think uh, we, we may uh, disagree on a jurisprudential level a bit is uh, the, the rule of law, the relationship between the rule of law and the Constitution. Uh, listeners, you know, I wrote a book about this specifically, which you can uh, buy at the FMF or you can find on the Rule of Law Project's website. Um, now, basically, the, the Constitution in Section 1C declares the rule of law and the Constitution to be co-equally supreme. And uh, to me, uh, as I explore in the book, that means that the Constitution itself must be interpreted uh-huh. to comply with the rule of law. So the provisions that you mentioned that give government... Uh, that appear to give government the amount of power that it should not have properly uh, within a constitutional framework, Mm -hmm. I think that the courts should interpret uh, those provisions respecting the rule of law, respecting the other principles of constitutionalism, and then turning that provision into something that is in fact compliant. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, when you and I spoke uh, privately the other day, um, like the right to housing, for example, that is obviously something that I would argue, and maybe you would also argue, is not something that a constitution should properly be concerned with. Um, But I think that if you read that so-called right from a rule of law limited state perspective, then you can make a very uh, cogent argument to say that this simply means that you as an individual have the right to provide for your own housing and government may not stand in your way rather than how our courts have interpreted, and this is part of Mpiaki's question, uh, and that is that the constitution is based on this uh, nebulous idea of transformative constitutionalism and this just means that government can do whatever it likes as long as it has a noble aim mm-hmm. um, and obviously then it will read the right to housing as basically meaning no government must provide housing and the private sector must provide free housing and all these things uh, so it, it's 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 um, as many lawyers will tell you I guess from the legal realist and critical legal studies perspective the law is a matter of interpretation there's no objective law 
-hmm. it's simply whatever the judge says it is and i think that we have a a point to make there about um con constitutions have to be read in a libertarian way right, yes, yes, because yes, yes. constitutionalism is inherently a classical liberal phenomenon there without the classical liberal intellectual mm -hmm. movement there would be no constitutionalism so i i, I think uh, we we disagree a yeah. bit there but i think uh, we we actually mm -hmm. agree on the substance wouldn't yeah. you say also that you say that uh going back you say that you um you think that constitution the constitution itself cannot is not subservient to the rule of law mm. however don't you think the, the constitution itself gives light to the rule of law mm. because the rule of law it doesn't really necessarily have a you know it's not codified but we mm. understand it as classical libertarians as you know um, ensuring that government is limited to a point where the individual can mm. dictate what they do to, in their lives yeah. so my, 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 my perspective was why, why I said that the constitution is 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 um subservient to the rule of law is that basically the constitution is basically um supposed to be taking uh concepts from the rule of law mm. and codifying that's sure. all that's all yeah. i see the constitution as mm. is basically giving light and infusing mm. the concepts of rule of law rather than constitution being on, on the same uh, uh level as uh the rule of law mm. if i may say because mm. like um I, I don't know about um, other governments across the world. Maybe there are some governments that aren't there are governments across the world that just have rule of law, but not necessarily a constitution, but still ensure that, you know, um, uh, individuals' rights are protected to the mm. point where government cannot dictate or interfere with their normal lives. Yeah, there is no such state. The, the, mm. the Brits say that there is such a state. They say we don't have a constitution, but we have this rule of law that is supreme. Uh, it's... It's a lot of gobbledygook, I would yeah. say, uh, <laughs> because the British government, uh, pre-Brexit, pre post-Brexit, doesn't matter. Uh, they have a lot of uh, even more interventionist things than in South Africa, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to freedom of speech, yes. uh, surveillance of the state over private uh, affairs. Yeah, well, so, yeah, well, yeah. geez, uh, National Health Service. Yeah, yes. you can't talk about that because it's a holy cow. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I agree that the Constitution, in, in that way, is subservient, but, but in the sense that it must always be read to comply with the rule of law. Um, and, and I think we, we agree on that, because I, I my argument is that you cannot have law outside of the ambit of the rule of law. So if you, if you want to give effect to the Constitution, you must read it as compliant with the rule of law. So, okay. so in that sense, I, I think I get what you're saying, and, I'm, mm -hmm. and I definitely agree. So uh, or, or, or just a follow-up question on something you said, Martin, as a, as a layman who is, uh, who, who is terrified of a world run by lawyers, well, when you said that um, the, the law is whatever the judge says it is, then what's, what's the limiting factor for the judge? What, what limits the judge's power themselves? Okay, so, well, um, one of the, it's basically tradition, so I know a lot of people don't think that's a, a, a good means to limit a, a, a judicial institution, but in the West, it has proven pretty effective. Uh, it's it's not done so well in Africa, I, I think there may be... Because uh, of the tension between, you know, the West and its colonial uh, <laughs> history and yeah. retaking aspects, which yeah. in, in tune are basically also African aspects, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, know, I, say, I, I think the problem in Africa is that uh, we we didn't give judges classical liberal constitutions to interpret because during colonialism there was this notion that that's an outdated version of constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. So African countries had these very blatantly oppressive constitutions. Yeah, um, but but uh, so the tradition that limits the judge basically comes down to this idea that no decision can be made by a court without the judge basing that decision in existing uh, precedent and existing law um, and, and, and uh, rationalizing what he said with reference to the, the, the fundamental principles of, of the law. Now, the American courts have done this brilliantly. I think uh, uh, British courts have done this very well. Um, South African courts in the past did this well, bearing in mind the fact that we did not have a constitution in those days. Mm. But when it came to to uh, to normal law, they actually did their research. They knew the common law. Mm -hmm. um, they knew uh, notion, uh, legal doctrines, and so forth. Our current judges don't. Yeah. They and, don't yeah. know the law. I just want to uh, also a quick point because you mentioned it. It's also important to note that. Um, South Africa used to be a, had have used to have parliamentary sovereignty like mm. the, the UK has 
So even if uh, we had the best judges in the world during apartheid, yes. it wouldn't have made much difference because parliament ultimately had the final say. But you can continue to. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're right. So we had parliamentary sovereignty, but but our judges were just of a, a higher caliber. Maybe because they were really uh, bred in this British or British constitutionalist uh, tradition, as the, as the Americans have been. Now we've made conscious efforts in South Africa, unfortunately, since those days to move away from that. Uh, and it's again, it's somewhat the fault of the Americans, because after we enacted our our new constitutional dispensation, a bunch of Americans wrote a bunch of articles saying, yeah, you can't you can't do this liberal constitutional thing anymore because. There's a lot of inequality in South Africa, so government needs to be proactive and the judges shouldn't get in the way. So, uh, yes, I mean, it's it's not a foolproof system. I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that the judiciary is often ineffectual. You do need a constitutional culture for it to be effective. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. On, on that, you know, I think that, you know, there's no perfect system. Mm. It's run by human beings. But, you know, like Martin said, the, the judges themselves have to be bred in constitutionalism. You have to know what the rule of law, what our constitution means and why we put it in place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like you said, you know, our judges from the past, even though there were judges during the apartheid regime and, you know, they were subservient to the pol- the parliament, which was obviously overtly racist, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but they, st- they always stuck to the law. They were always... And they always had... They always... Uh, made room for for them to have introspection and mm. rev- um, revisit their own judgments and say mm-hmm. maybe I could have you know and those are prints and basically like Helen Susan says like if when in doubt go back to the principles mm-hmm. and that's what um, judges used to do yeah. when they were in doubt they go back to the principles of constitution or well, the rule of law mm. and they would stick to that and even reverse you know the apex courts back in that time the appellate division had judges who would, who would go back and be like, no, this is maybe we can um, mm. revisit this judgment and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And the difference today is that most judges want to be celebrities, you know. Exactly. Yeah, Reverend Reverend Mukhay Mukhay, <laughs> like, you know, I re- you know, he's he's always speaking about you know corruption, morality, <laughs> stuff like that. But when you when you look at his judgments, he's very he's lacking in constitutional. Um, knowledge yeah. knowledge yes yeah. he's not he's he's not he's not putting he's not putting uh confidence back into the into into the rule of law which south africans need because they've been you know because the rule of law has just been eroded in south africa mm-hmm. yeah. and yeah. that's where the check that's where that's why the judiciary is is what it is because it's a checks and balances pro, um yeah. institution so yeah. it's supposed to be no, that's, um, you know giving confidence sorry to interrupt guys yeah. but the rule of law is a huge topic as we <laughs> at the fmf has shown me and so we will not finish it today but <laughs> <laughs> today uh, we got some i think good some really good points from both of you guys i thought we also talk about um immigration and so is it the first question maybe would be uh, is it the role of the state to even control who moves across its borders? In my opinion, yes. You yeah. need to firstly you need to, you need to have like for example, if I can put it in practical terms, if someone is to commit a crime but they're illegal immigrant, you don't have them on your database. So then after that you can't even um in 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 layman's terms, they, they to the law itself cannot protect them because they're not the a citizen itself. However the constitution does give um, provision for people that are not citizens. However, you know you need to have a process in which you are um, seeing who comes in and who comes out, and who's bringing what and who's who's going out with what. You know, in your own country, so you have so uh, sovereignty. You know, like you need to know the people that are in your in your anything, and also it and also the laws, so the immigration laws. I think it's based on the people that are in the. the um, the government and the society them, uh, themselves who really regulate the laws of okay. immigration. So uh, my follow-up question yeah. would be then, since you, uh, since you pretty much, I think, so it sounds like you agree that uh, government should have some role in, in terms of um, at least knowing who co- crosses the border. Then what what is the what what powers should it have once someone reaches the border? Should it like what, 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 on what basis should these people uh, be restricted what, on what basis should entry be restricted if it is restricted on um, what basis should people be allowed to come in and so on look uh, it's a it's a tough question because you know there's people that are seeking asylum mm. and they're running away from war zones mm. and you obviously need to take that in account but you know if if 
you know, the, the buck stops when you want to come into my country and now you want to change my laws, you want to mm-hmm. change my society. You know, like you came to me. It's like, you know, when you think about, you invite people into your house knowing who they are and what they uh, and what they bring to your house. You know, you're not going to just invite any stranger into your house because you're protecting the people within your house. So you can be a friendly person, you know, like you can, you know, allow um, asylum seekers to come, but you need to also make it clear that you know you need to adhere to our laws you need to um re- reassimilate to society because i have a bunch of people in my in my country who believe in these values who um who who, who represent these values and they and they want that to be the case i'm protecting my citizens and that's how immigration laws should work okay you should be protecting the citizens in your country so what i'm trying to get from, is um like what? What's what's the nature of this protection? Like you know, you know what I mean. Like it's uh, oh, is it by, is it is it like a case uh, of um? Well, you cheat. You, do we do we do we stop you at the border and say, hmm, uh, you look kind of dark. You're probably going to kill someone. You turn oh, back, or no, do we no, no, <laughs> do we no. use some other criteria? <laughs> no, no, definitely not. You should use uh, like basically. You should ask the person. Should the person themselves must say, I'm here to work, or I'm here. Um, I'm here to 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 study. Mm. There must reasons why you in my you you in the you in my country. Put reasons. Be, you can't just say I'm running away. Um, you can't say that, but um, well, yeah, you can't say that. But like, um, you have to also contribute to the to society itself, my country. So you can't just come here and just loaf around. You know what I mean? Uh, who, so <laughs> so who decides uh, whether your uh, your contribution to society is uh, is valuable? Who can who, who who decides? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I feel like the uh, the individuals themselves decide via uh, um, elections. You know, when and then after it, they promote the government. Uh, government must be the one that um, is basically the the one that's enforcing those mm. those principles. So, uh, in that sense, I feel like it's the citizens that must decide who on what basis you allow you. You can't, uh, you're allowed to bring to come into the country. Yeah, so so I basically disagree with everything. Uh, I, I think I think we agree that government does have a role to control who comes in and out. The the scope of that control is where we totally disagree. Uh, so I I believe in something called the presumption of entry. If you arrive at the border, the assumption should be that you can go in. Uh, provided that you are not intending to do harm to the liberty or property of the people on the other side of the border. So this is the open borders position. Uh, it's it's, it's just similar to an open door policy at an office. You can come in until you do something really bad, then I'm going to keep you out. Um, that means that there is no such thing as uh, you need to speak the language or contribute skills because all of these are market phenomenon. If you want to come in, you have no skills whatsoever you're going to be poor in that country and your circumstances where you came from are going to be the exact same. Um, and, and, and only the market, I ask you, who decides? As far as I'm concerned, the only non-arbitrary determiner can be the market. So if I come to a society as a lawyer, there are way too many lawyers in every country, that is a given. <laughs> um, but uh, currently, governments will exclude lawyers because there's an oversupply. Yet, what if I have a job offer? What if I am going to open my own business there? I don't think it should be government's uh, or is really government's uh, responsibility to make that decision on my behalf, on behalf of the, it, its citizens uh, or on behalf of its economy. That, that to me is too arbitrary. And I mean, if we adopt the free market idea that government lacks knowledge fundamentally government uh, does not know what is best for its citizens economically then i think it follows that one must assume that government also does not know whether uh, someone arriving at the border is going to contribute to society or not i mean government's role simply and exclusively is to protect liberty and property rights yeah. and, so, so, yeah. so much to clarify more about your position so do you believe that um Let's say, for example, you have an individual. Okay, let me give you two K two scenarios. You have one 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 is an individual who comes from a very uh, crime-ridden area, 
let's say for example if you had a country in in in, in the north the african continent which is the equivalent of johannes back in terms of crime or something in other words south africa yes. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. so if you had someone coming from a country like that would you let that person in of okay. course okay yeah. and what, what about so what about someone with a criminal record on in their home country and is on the run maybe let's say it's... yeah so i mean that's that's where government's role comes a bit more into play so if this person is literally on the run from the law mm. then no you obviously do not let them in unless and i we're getting very idealistic here uh, so I'm talking in principle now. I will have a different view when it uh, when it comes to uh, the actual pragmatics of it. Ide- ideally, uh, if someone comes to the border and they're on the run, yeah, so the, uh, they should be let in, provided that the law they actually broke is something that it is within government's legitimate purview to prohibit. So if someone is a prostitute from uh, Botswana is running away because the very conservative Botswana government is uh, trying to prosecute her for prostitution, I would say yes, our government must absolutely let her in and immediately presume that she has not committed any crime whatsoever. Of course, when it comes to murder, theft, uh, for, uh, fraud, etc., uh, we in, in law we call it uh, mala and se as, a, as opposed to mala prohibitia uh, mala and se are those crimes that from the act itself it's a crime whether it's prohibited by law or not mm. murder those things rape yeah. etc mala prohibitia is things that government sits around the table and it's like huh should this be illegal or not so uh, all mala and se uh, um, uh, a criminal in its nature those crimes no you cannot come in mm-hmm. uh if, if you're at you have a history of terrorism and you haven't been prosecuted in your home country of course you cannot come in mm-hmm. but if you're a, a drug dealer for example I, I don't know if we will agree on this but if you're a drug dealer then of course you should be let in uh if 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 um so on, on the, let's say you have a history of terrorism so you by history you mean that someone has gone to a court of law been found guilty of terrorist charges yeah, so if if you were uh, if if you were found guilty of terrorism charges, uh, and you are you did not serve your time, uh, mm. then you should not be let in. Of course, I I'm firmly of the view that if you have served your time, uh, merely having a criminal record cannot be a reason for exclusion because, per definition, you have paid off your so-called debt to society by serving time. So then the the presumption of entry should apply again. But uh, uh, I don't think that the domestic population of a country has any right to to say that we have certain values and they must be, quote unquote, protected. Because, uh, I mean, this argument is usually made in connection with cultural values, etc. It's very popular in the West nowadays. If you have a culture that's worth protecting, for goodness sake, protect it. (laughs) But do not ask the state to use its force and its violence to protect your culture and I think uh, South Africa uh, is, is an example of that uh, in the past Afrikaners literally used the state to so call uh, quote unquote protect their culture that is the uh, basis upon which apartheid was literally built um, but since apartheid has ended cultural protections for Afrikaans and Afrikaners has fallen away completely there is no more legal protection for the Afrikaner culture mm. Yet, there is an argument to be made that it is the strongest uh, uh, institutional culture in this country because it's being kept alive by the people who believe in it. They don't need the power of the state to protect it. Uh, and, and, and I think that's a, an example to, to, to bear in mind across the world. And, and also, I yeah. think uh, you can also make a very strong argument that uh, apartheid uh, actually, actually weakened uh, mm-hmm. Afri- African culture and yeah. only now is it, is it experiencing a revival because yes. it doesn't have the states on its side uh, anymore. Side anymore. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so, so, yeah, so yeah, 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 I think we, we disagree we on that disagree. a bit, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're representing the majority of you. I think immigration is just a different for, you know. for, the, for the purposes of this episode, I am completely neutral. Eh? <laughs> ah, right. <laughs> That's a <laughs> position you always so, take. <laughs> so, I wanted to ask you uh, on your position to develop it a little more in terms of uh, you said that uh, people make uh, choices as, as individuals through voting. Now, doesn't that isn't that um, sort of uh, add to uh, counteract the individualist or liberal position? Like in the sense that uh, the, pro- the, the the whole point of having liberal democracies is that uh, you shouldn't have the mob or the majority crowd uh, basically uh, taking away other people's uh, their, uh, individual rights and also the rule of law. 
what what what, what would you say okay. to that um yeah obviously i believe that you know the majority even though it's the majority it shouldn't mm. overpower the minority mm. um however pra- practically if everyone is voting for one party mm. and there's only a few people that are voting for a different party wouldn't wouldn't those that majority's views not necessarily mean more but wouldn't they actually um wouldn't they actually be able to um so basically in on that point um your question sorry your question mm. was the fact that um because you, you said the, one of your justifications for government yeah, stopping people for oh. the benefits of their citizens was that the people themselves who are those central individuals because they voted for that government to do those things presumably then they are exercising their individual rights and uh, i suppose that would also mean that for example let's say um 99 percent of south africa decides to we, we want Im- we want to keep immigrants out so this is just to sort of, sort of show you what i mean by the yeah. question yeah and let's say there's one guy standing for you and Rupert. He says, "Just I just want any Somalian yeah. who wants to come to my farm to come there." <laughs> but because ninety nine percent of South Africans have said no, we don't want Somalians. So how would how okay. that? Yeah, I don't so think. Um, oh, like based on based on the the the, the concept, the principle of libertarian democracy. Mm. Uh, even though, even yes, even though the majority are pushing culture, shouldn't be. Like yeah, like we like we said, it shouldn't be the onus on onus shouldn't be on the government to to enact laws that represent that that culture, mm. that those values. It should it still should uh, keep libertarian. So in that sense, in in practicality, in pra- in practice, in practice, I feel like um, government. What is this? We don't we see a number of people moving across borders who have criminal records or are trying to pursue criminal means in a different mm. country. In a different country and so that's the thing how do you how, how do you regulate those people when you say that the presumption when you use the presumption of entry you know they could obviously say you know they could obviously say i want to be i, I want to i just want to live in the country i just mm. want to run away it um for my bad for my bad yeah. for my bad country however you don't but they haven't uh, told you that they're still gonna do the they're gonna do um trafficking they're gonna uh, mm. continue um Drugs, mm. uh, nothing wrong drugs. With drugs. Yeah, yeah, nothing. <laughs> 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 but yeah, they, they're not. They haven't told you that part. But then after that's basically one of their goals yeah. is to still continue the crime, the criminal syndicates in our country. So like that's the thing. So basically, pra- uh, in practice, there has to be re- regulations and laws that are that that have to speak to that. For me, that's yeah. what I believe. You know, from personal experience, but obviously. Okay, I'm, I'm going to allow each of you just to have one final short statement on this topic, and then we can move on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. So, uh, just on that, um, uh, I agree that if government stuck to ma- matters of criminality, I don't think there would be this big debate about immigration. I think if what you just said was the totality of immigration law, then the problem would be 80% solved. Unfortunately, uh, government has made it its business to look at all types of other things, your culture, uh, where you're coming from, specifically if you're from Syria, then you're presumed to be bad, whatever, uh, and and skills. Uh, Not everyone can be a PhD in biochemistry, unfortunately. So if government left that and went with what you just said, criminality, I would still have a problem with that to an extent, but it would be far better. Um, So yeah, that's that's my final word on that. Yeah, yeah. for for me, it's just... uh, uh, what, what government doesn't practice you as much as yes you believe that you know anyone can come into your because uh anyone can come into your into your country and live you know running away from what they what they mm. what they were going through in the country of birth you know i feel like you know government is still allowed to however government must still enact regulations that stop criminality mm. you know stop ensure that criminality is not uh continued in our country and um that's the only part in practice i have uh when you come to like martin said pragmatism is a different thing to ideology you know ideally of course i want anyone hey guys come through you know whatever you should want to live in here and be peaceful cool but if you um but you know obviously the real world doesn't tell us that you know yeah. there's people that want to so yeah uh, it's a it's a tough question but you know the the, the yeah. um the difficulties with the, the the laws and regulations in which you enact Okay, and then um, I think one of the things that uh, 
are relevant to the to the immigration debate but also to many other things and like to the entire economy as well would be welfare and so what are you two guys um, view on the nature of, of the state and whether it should be pre providing for the well-being welfare social safety net whatever you want to call it for the citizens who live in that particular state let's start with you martin Oh, well, yeah, so um, obviously as a dogmatic libertarian, I don't see any role for the state to provide for the citizens of the state. I don't think that that is part of the uh, the nature of the state, as, as the first thing a, a politics 101 student learns is that uh, the state is the institutionalization of legitimate force. Uh, it's inherently a violent institution. That is its, its main characteristic. It does not ask, the state tells. Um, and for that reason, that is that is the, the reason why I regard the only legitimate mandate of the state to be those things that have to do with violence. So if you enact force or fraud, which is uh, latent violence against someone, the state will use violence against you regardless of your, your, uh, your consent to it. But now we're talking about the state building libraries, the state uh, providing uh, welfare grants. These are all things that have to do with, uh, I guess in philosophy they call it the, the good life. This has to do with uh, what would make life more bearable for people. And I, I think that is important. But I don't see, and I, I've, I've had long discussions with people on this, I don't see why there is a connection between the good life and the state providing the good life. I mean, we're not going around saying that nurseries where children are being ca uh, cared for, uh -huh. that they need to provide the tanks, for example. It's absurd. It's it, You cannot say that a nursery needs to build tanks because that's not the nature of what a nursery is or what a nursery okay. must do. And that is the exact argument I use with the state. It's that there is a very fixed mandate that is evident from the very nature of the state the institution and that does not include making sure people live bearably it simply means people must when they go to bed at night be confident that if someone uses force against them they will be punished and you will get back whatever you've lost if that's a tangible thing so that's just a summary of of the I guess the the dogmatic libertarian monarchist position on on welfare. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and this on this point, um, ideally, I feel like you know the market will take care of these people. You know, like I feel like um, if you free up the market to a point where basically individuals are dictating to themselves what they're doing, they will be able to, like for example, welfare uh, recipients like um, people that can't disabled mm. people and old people have family members that can take care of them. And if we have yeah. a market, if we have a free market system, um, you, I, yes, ideally you will have salaries in which you can still take care of the people that are, cannot be taken care of, that cannot take care of themselves. Yeah. Like, so if I had my mom was um, 70 year old and she had Alzheimer's and um, if there was a free market, I'd have a job at least that can also take care of her and she can also live in my house. Uh, practic so basically for me, the poorer the nation, the more free market you have to have mm. so then after that you can actually um you mm. can actually provide via the market yeah. um um you know um mm. help for people that cannot take care of themselves and and what you also see from the market is that people when there's a free market there's obviously more peace and more people want to help other people yeah. even yeah. if they're not even from yeah. the same family you see many ngos see many um organizations foundations that help people that cannot take care of themselves and these ngos are helped by uh donate um they have donors that mm. will, will send them money so that they can take care of these people so in that sense yes i feel like you know state shouldn't be involved so like what you just heard from me you heard i never said anything about the state yeah. so the state should never be involved in welfare however practically that's the thing like you know ideally well, I, I, ideology and um in the real world you know it it, it offers two different uh, scenarios yeah. practically we have a situation where we have so many people, old people that cannot take care of themselves and a system where old people, um, um, a system where there's no free market. So I guess, you know, when you have less free market, you need more, you need the state more involved. And that's where you go into a rabbit hole in which the state is going to obviously have to take care more and more people because it's not, um, it's, there's no markets for it for uh for people to be taken care of by yeah. that market, right. so I guess in my sense. Uh, so, but but I think uh, what I'm getting from both of you guys, you guys both basically agree that uh, 
if in to the extent that there is a problem with uh, charity welfare and all of this it's mostly a problem caused by government not only by government but mostly mm. so would you guys say this fair yeah yeah i, I would agree yeah, yeah, yeah i think yeah i would agree because the government just doesn't know just doesn't know what it's doing most of the time yeah, in yeah. The opinion, because it's not supposed to be like Marshall so, said it has a mandate so what what what, what, what do you guys think about uh, you know a transitional transitional me- measures before we get to a free market or before the free market can kick in and people can start uh, doing things for themselves what do you think about trans- transitional measures like uh, vouchers and charter schools and things like that mm. it helps for the first generation yeah because a lot of people now Poor. But but are, are, are you are you, are you opposed to those kinds of I'm transitional measures of like as, as a sort of stopgap until we get to the point where everyone no, has, no I'm not yeah. opposed because at the end of the day that's not our taxes yeah. mm. so uh, we pay taxes because we think that we're gonna help other people that cannot take care of themselves so in that sense you know I think that um, um, I think that yes you know I'll, I'll agree with the voucher system however with free markets the voucher system will. Will come to a point where it's no more needed because people mm. can take care of yeah. themselves. That's why I say first generation. Now the people that are living now are poor and are living through poverty, a high number of poverty levels in South Africa. But however, if you free up the market, the next generation, their kids and their grandkids will be able to, will be able to take care of themselves as well as um, their grandmothers and their grandfathers. Yeah. So, <clears throat> in that sense, yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with the voucher system. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, I agree. Martin, yeah. I, I wanted to, I, like you, I want to to answer the question as well. But I also wanted to add something for you specifically, uh, since we we both, we all three of us basically agree that it's not in the uh, the legitimate role of the state to provide welfare vouchers. But we can, uh, I, I think we can sort of agree that it's it's a, a common sense measure. So how do we reconcile what seems to be a common sense measure in terms of being it's a transitional thing, and the and the and the and the principle which says that it's not the legitimate role of government. No, so I think that's that's exactly what the transitional measures do. They bridge this gap between the ideal and the pragmatic. Mm. So, so we may we do need to make this dis- distinction between what is ideal and what is pragmatic. But we must never lose sight of what the ideal mm. is, because the ideal establishes what I would consider a moral imperative. Mm. You cannot just say that's ideal, but we need to now just mm-hmm. concern ourselves yeah, with this. Yes, yes, yes. yes, you must do what is pragmatic, but with a very uh, clear view yeah. to attaining the ideal yeah. and that is what the transitionary measures do you basically say okay the ideal is established it's a f- completely free market yeah. where the state does only that one thing uh, and we uh, we cannot do that immediately because that will lead to maybe societal collapse yeah, yeah, chaos, uh, yeah. yes so then you say okay how do we get from here to there but actually like move not like say yeah, so, yeah. we'll get there at some point it's in, fine in practice you're working yeah. towards the idea and, 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 and you take the pragmatic Approach. Yeah, so then you do the yeah, vouchers, yeah. you do the charter schools, yeah, yes. but of course with a uh, sunset clause, because otherwise the next government is just gonna yeah. uh, uh, t- uh, keep renewing. Yeah. So, so that's so that is that is how you bridge this gap between the ideal and the uh, the pragmatic. But the point is, you need to identify the ideal because in South Africa, mm. we're not saying that we're working towards that ideal. In fact, our government. Uh, regularly congratulates itself by how much how many people, people are on welfare, welfare yeah. so its ideal is not the total free market no, but the total state yes. and that is where we're going so we need to identify the ideal correctly before we even start to talk about the pragmatics yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I, I agree with both of you guys and also like, this, yeah. um, when you um, when you when you take the pragmatic approach you should stick to that um, you should stick to that that approach, even if things are not going well, um, um, in pract in practice, you know sometimes you know you have issues, and maybe in different provinces where they don't have the skills or the, the ability or the infrastructure to do the voucher system. Mm-hmm. However, you you identify the problem, but you never leave the ideal because you're trying yeah. to move towards the ideal. Exactly. So when you when we say yes, the voucher system must work, must uh, you must implement the voucher system. You must also ensure that. If also like for example, if you do it also for universities, you must also free up the market at the same time. Oh, I see. Because exactly. You're, yeah, because you're yeah. trying to trying to get to the yeah. ideal, but there's also two sides to the coin. You want to help people, mm-hmm. and you want to see yourself as Jesus. But remember, <laughs> we have we have a goal that we're trying to yeah. reach, yeah. and so that goal will be much or will be achieved if we do these type of this. Um, yeah. Take these. No, I think we're agreed. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Yeah. And then Martin, just to end, could you just? Uh, 
uh, I heard something interesting about that. Uh, it seems that EWC now is go is it's been handed over to an ad hoc committee to draft the actual amendment. So mm. what are your thoughts on this, Martin? I know you've been following this very closely for the FMF. Yeah, so let me just summarize it briefly. I mean, we've discussed EWC to death on this podcast. But basically, it was uh, announced, I think, yesterday or today by uh, some parliamentary institution that uh, an ad hoc committee is being formed, and that is with a view to drafting the amendment to the Constitution mm. to uh, ensure that property can now be expropriated without compensation and the uh, deadline for this committee to report back to parliament is the 31st of march of 2020 that's next year uh, so yeah it's still a lot of time i think this gives south africa gives south africans another opportunity to really rally together in defense of the constitution in defense of property rights uh, just briefly uh, South Africa, the, the, the whole reason South Africa is as poor as it is today is because the vast majority of the people in this country were denied property rights right from the get-go, uh, denied land. Uh, land was literally taken from them by force through the state and that is the very crux of poverty in this country and uh, we, we had a reprieve when the constitution was enacted. It gave everyone the right to property and if we don't respect that uh, we are going to exacerbate poverty and uh, if the constitution is amended in such a way I mean it can still be amended in a responsible way which I very highly doubt but if it is amended uh, in, in how I think it will be amended uh, it will basically entrench poverty in a way that we will never be able to escape it yeah. and it will be just be permanent so please South Africans listeners uh, even if you're not a hardcore libertarian or even a classical liberal or a liberal democrat you must recognize that the very problem in this country has has consistently been that the majority has not mm. been able to uh, 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 reap the fruits of their labor and uh, and uh, uh, use those resources to their own benefit that it has always had to be in the service of some social experiment by the state. We need to avoid that. And then I think uh, you need to stand against EWC yeah. uh, in any comment period and even in the media for the next uh, year. Okay. Uh, no, I couldn't have said it better myself. And I would just like to thank both of you guys for being good sports. It was a long podcast today, but <laughs> I think it was worth it in terms of the content. I think we got some really good discussion. We, got, we really got deep into some important issues. So I thank both of you. And Martin, could you just please give us the social media info? Definitely. So uh, please subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. That is the big red button right under the uh, video. Subscribe, guys. Subscribe. Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> follow us on Twitter. That is at FMF South Africa, one word. Um, and like us on Facebook. That is Free Market Foundation South Africa or in the URL facebook.com slash FMFSA. And always please uh, remember to check our website www.freemarketfoundation.com every day for all of our new content. And thanks for sticking with us for about an hour. <laughs> and, and we'll be back next week or, or the others will be back next week. I'll be in Germany. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, see you again. Cheers. It was a nice uh, goodbye episode for you, Martin. Yeah. <laughs> Cheerio. Yeah.